Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome here to CSIS. My name is Sarah Ladislaw. I direct the Energy and National Security Program here, and we just wanted to welcome all of you uh, for the event this afternoon, Latin American Energy and Oil and Gas Market Overview. We're very pleased to host this session with our partners in the Americas Program, which is run by Carl Meacham. Um, so for a little bit of context, uh, we started a series here uh, that, uh, that is looking at uh, the, uh, the political and market implications of the energy price downturn. Um, for those of you who are familiar with uh, at least what the, uh, the energy program here at CSIS does, uh, is we look around the world at sort of what's going on in oil and gas markets and try and uh, evaluate it and keep it updated and sort of be a forum for discussion about what's happening. Uh, this particular year, we've got a, a, a great deal of interest uh, with the significant oil price decline uh, in the last six plus months uh, and uh, great interest in whether or not we're seeing sort of uh, structural or temporary changes in oil markets going forward. Uh, and so several weeks back, we had a big public session that tried to talk about uh, what was actually happening in the oil markets, what was happening in terms of U.S. tight oil production, and what was happening just purely from a market perspective uh, in other major uh, oil-producing countries around the world. Uh, and then we, uh, because we're here at CSIS and we've got such great regional partners uh, in the regional programs, decided that it would make a lot of sense to... Uh, then sort of divide the world into regions and take a look at what's happening uh, in, in the Middle East and Africa and Europe, uh, Eurasia, and uh, certainly Latin America. And so when we think about um, good macroeconomic, political, and oil and gas analysis as it deals with Latin America, it doesn't take us very long uh, to think of inviting uh, IPD Latin America uh, and John Padilla and uh, David Vogt here. Uh, who are managing directors to come and sort of present uh, their view on their perspective uh, of what's happening in the region. So that's what we're going to do this afternoon. Uh, John and David are going to tag team on uh, a presentation that will cover uh, Argentina, Venezuela, Colombia, Mexico, and Brazil. So I hope you have uh, brought your appetite for uh, uh, tourism because uh, we're going to cover a lot of countries in a short period of time. Uh, and then Carl uh, Meacham is going to do uh, give us some perspective on how he thinks some of these energy market, uh, oil and gas market uh, implications might uh, factor into uh, some of the political landscape in the region. So uh, I'm going to stop talking because we've got enough to cover in a short period of time. The only last thing I'll say uh, is that... Um, uh, David is actually going to have to leave uh, at 3 o'clock. And so what we'll do is John will present some three sort of macro overview slides, uh, and then David will start on Venezuela and Argentina. We'll take a small break uh, for discussion, uh, for questions, uh, if you have any on those two countries in particular. And then we'll sort of uh, proceed with uh, uh, John for the rest of the presentation. So uh, John and, and, uh, and uh, David, thank you very much, and uh, take it away. Fantastic. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation, Sarah. It's uh, fantastic to be um, back here in D.C. and um, probably contrary to most folks here in the room, um, I'm quite delighted to be back in the cold. So I've um, been uh, down in Bogota for the last four years, and uh, uh, my parents ask about the weather, and I say, well, it's the same as it was yesterday, and it will probably be the same tomorrow. So um, all right, uh, why don't we just go ahead and get started. Um, just kind of as a starting point, I think um, what we've been doing for the last 15 years, David and I, uh, has really been based on gathering a lot of information from a lot of different sources. And so the only thing that I would point out here is, is, is simply that this is our interpretation of how we see things. There's a lot of moving parts going on right now with uh, a lower oil price environment globally. Uh, certainly, uh, Latin America is not immune, and so some of the takeaways that we have here today are very much uh, based on, on, that, on that premise. So I think that um, what we wanted to start out with is, is just kind of really a, a macro overview of what we're seeing in, in the marketplace. And I mean, you pick up the newspaper uh, every day, and you're hearing about new cuts that are, that are taking place. Um, so... The way that we kind of categorize that is, is that you're seeing that in, in terms of CapEx. CapEx is being cut anywhere between 10 and 40 percent, 50 percent. Then you're seeing uh, layoffs that are taking place, which are really having an impact, and that'll have a big impact in, in Latin America. Uh, you're also then uh, just seeing projects being canceled or uh, monies uh, being uh, shut in. 
so companies are, are pulling out of different uh, markets, et cetera. Uh, and then I think the, the fourth element that uh, you, you'll, you'll we'll definitely see uh, increasing amounts of is, is M&A. And so in a low oil price environment, not everybody is equal, and the, the chances that uh, people are then going to look to uh, absorb uh, different assets, whether it's on the service um, uh, sector side or it's on the operator side, I think are, are very, very high. And the longer this um, moves or, or stays in place, the low oil price environment, I think the more pressure you're going to probably see on, on that front. So what we did is we took a look at three uh, Latin American uh, uh, energy companies that, that, are, that are publicly traded. Um, and what's interesting, I mean, most people are, are quite familiar with this, but the, 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 the price impact has been tremendous. And I mean, it's been for different reasons for, for different companies, but anywhere over the last six months, uh, a drop of 50 to, in the case of Pacific Rubiales, close to 80% in stock price is having a massive, massive impact. And so that's going to have an impact in terms of uh, CapEx spend, it's in terms of where they're de uh, deploying their assets. And it's just much more magnified when you're taking look at uh, some of the, the impact that you're going to have in certain countries in Latin America. Um, so as a result, what people are doing is anybody that can go to the market is going to the market. And uh, here we just took a look at uh, the three NOCs um, that, that we're going to focus on uh, t uh, today. And what you see is, is that uh, each of them is, is going uh, and raising, uh, you know, billions of dollars. Um, and so, you know, the price differential, uh, you know, Pemex continues to, to, to really receive some fantastic spreads in the market. They went out in January and uh, raised $6 billion, which was uh, one of the largest issues ever. Um, and, and the price point is, is quite fantastic. Um, uh, you know, less so, uh, obviously, for Petavesa, uh, and, and that's, that's a sit-go bond. Uh, then when you take a look at uh, Petavesa bonds, obviously you're looking at uh, closer to 20% plus. So um, that's kind of way of background, and what we're going to do, is, as Sarah said, is uh, start out with, uh, with Venezuela and Argentina, um, and I'll turn it over to, uh, to David. All right, thanks, John. Um, so we're going to try to handle a very complicated situation in just a few minutes uh, with Venezuela. Um, first of all, there's obviously a, a, a serious political uh, issue in Venezuela today. There's a serious economic issue or financial issue in Venezuela. Um, uh, in terms of political or sociopolitical crisis, uh, we have some drivers. Um, the first is uh, President Maduro's declining popularity. Um, obviously, uh, if, if we take a look down at the lower left-hand uh, chart, it's, it's really fascinating. Criminality or lack of security has been one of the most important factors or one of the biggest issues facing the Venezuelan people um, over the years. And uh, for the first time in 2014, uh, we saw that ec an economic issue, or in this case, scarcity of goods, has uh, gotten right up there with criminality. And as a matter of fact, in the first two months of this year, it surpassed uh, criminality. Uh, so the voting population is now starting to look at the economy as an issue that will reflect uh, upon uh, the, the government. Um, uh, the Venezuelan government has been slow uh, thus far to respond uh, to low oil, low oil prices by making any sort of economic adjustments. Um, therefore, we see a, a, a huge uh, impact on inflation. Um, right now, 65 to 70 percent, expected at 120 percent this year. Um, and uh, what you've all been reading about in, in the press certainly is the potential for Venezuela to default. Uh, these issues are going to be clearly the political issues, and uh, uh, certainly they're going to push for an eventual outcome of some sort. Um, right now, we see sort of three uh, potential outcomes. Uh, this is an electoral year, uh, National Assembly elections. We estimate now will be held in September. Um, uh, the opposition, as one scenario, could win the National Assembly elections. Um, they indicate that they would then um, uh, request a revocatory referendum on the president's mandate. There could potentially be a constituent assembly, which would 
uh, not necessarily re rewrite the Constitution in this case, but rework the country's institutions. Um, and, uh, and, and what I'd like to point out is that neither one of these options, uh, number one, require a, a, a majority in the National Assembly of the opposition, um, and neither one of the options are necessarily easy. I want to point out with regard to challenges with, for a referendum um, that in order to call the referendum, you actually need 20% uh, of registered voters. In this case, it's 3.78 million signatures. The opposition has a solid base of four million people, but let's remember what happened the last time a referendum was called. Uh, there was a clear witch hunt. So people are concerned about signing in this referendum. That will create one challenge. The second challenge is that 7.57 million people would have to go and vote to revoke the president's mandate. And once you get up to those numbers, uh, you find a situation that's even more uh, challenging. Um, another uh, potential outcome to a socioeconomic crisis in Venezuela could be a resignation of the president or a coup, both of which we see as um, being unlikely. Um, what we are seeing is a scenario of power by force. Uh, definitely, the military is beginning to play a more uh, predominant role in Venezuela, uh, and, and they're really keeping Maduro in power at this time. Um, so, so that, in a nutshell, is, is, is politics. What I would like everyone here to recognize is that um, the oil industry in Venezuela is inseparable from politics. It drives the entire country's economy. It actually represents um, pretty much all of hard currency um, uh, revenue. So um, when we look at the political situation in Venezuela, we have to understand intimately the oil industry. And what we've done is to, we've, we've created a couple different scenarios uh, for oil production. Um, the key issues that we want to look at here, who's in power, what's the price of oil, uh, the government's foreign exchange policy, oil industry capex. We want to see more capex going to um, exploration and production. You need barrels. And that is going to be really the challenge, Venezuela's dilemma this year. Where is it going to put its money? Um, you've seen in the press issues related to Petrocaribe and uh, en energy supply corporation agreements, um, supply at favorable terms to other countries, um, and, and you've also heard, seen in the press a lot about the potential for default. So Venezuela has three choices. It can put its money to imports to satisfy its population. It can put its money to uh, oil production uh, to keep production up, which is absolutely critical, or it can pay New York. Um, what's it going to do with the limited amount of money that it has? That's the question. And uh, we look at that with all of our, uh, the, these are the issues that we're looking at in, in drawing our, our uh, production pictures. Um, we have an optimistic scenario uh, through 2016 of 2.95 million barrels a day. Um, and uh, I believe, yes, we have that slide. And then a, and then a, a more pessimistic scenario of 2.54 million barrels a day. Again, in a low oil price environment, uh, uh, you're, you're not necessarily going to see an immediate drop off, uh, but you will uh, see some impact. What is important to understand is Venezuela relying on oil uh, production needs to put the money in. And here you can see our forecast for where oil production is going based on area. Um, we have oil production falling in the east and falling largely in the west of Venezuela. The, uh, represented by the red and blue uh, bars. Uh, the green bar represents where we think production is going to come from, new production, Orinoco Belt. They're putting all of their eggs in one basket, essentially. This production is expensive. It requires a lot of infrastructure. It requires between 10 and $14 billion a year in, in, in diluent imports to blend this heavy crude and bring it to market. Um, so it's, it's capital intensive. Without that capital, meaning something has to give with non-oil imports or debt repayment, um, you're going to have a pretty important fall in production. And so uh, basically uh, what we, we, we assume here, if we take a look at our optimistic scenario uh, for uh, cash flow, um, is that in a $40 oil price environment, uh, you can see 27.4 billion in revenue uh, from PDVSA, again, 96 to 97 percent of the country's total hard currency. Um, they have about four, and, and this is our optimistic scenario for oil production. Okay, so they need 
to import $14 billion worth of um, uh, hydrocarbons for their industry in order to produce more oil. Um, and then we've got about $11.5 billion in 2015 of debt repayment, which leaves a paltry $1.7 billion for the government coffer. So the government is going to have to find um, uh, different ways uh, to achieve that, uh, to, to fill that gap. Um, maybe you can look at uh, additional loans from China, maybe you can look at additional uh, Citgo bonds, maybe you can look at uh, taking some money from the different off-balance sheet uh, stabilization funds like Fonden. Um, Central Bank has loaned PDVSA money in the past. Uh, they have gold reserves that they might uh, look to tap into. They have some different ways, but the gap, um, as far as we see it, is between 20 and 35 to 40 billion dollars. And we see them being able at most to get about $20 billion in additional loans, additional financing. So they're facing a real serious problem at $40 a barrel. I think the general consensus is uh, um, uh, uh, $44 for 2015. Um, so just with that, I, I, I'd like you to understand that the situation in Venezuela is really complex from a political perspective. Understanding in, 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 in understanding the oil industry in particular. Um, jumping to Argentina, another complicated country, but still we, we kind of find it um, somewhat uh, optimistic. Um, first of all, in Argentina, you're seeing a, a shale revolution similar to what you're seeing in the United States. If you take a look at proved reserves, um, Argentina actually has all the proved reserves in Latin America uh, for shale gas of 802 uh, uh, TCF, um, 27 billion barrels of uh, shale oil. So they've got some reserves. Those reserves are mostly located in Neuquén, in the red area on the map, um, where you have a hundred years, uh, you have a hundred year tradition of oil exploration. So you've got infrastructure, you've, you, you've got human resources, uh, you, you have uh, a, a great deal of activity. If you take a look at what's happened, there's been 300 wells drilled in the Vaca Muerta shale play in 2014. Um, uh, uh, YPF has been integrally involved. There's 40,000 barrels a, a, a day being, of oil equivalent a day being produced in Vaca Muerta. Um, and what's interesting, and we'll see it on the next slide, is, is, is oil price. We'll get to that in just a minute. But um, on this lower right-hand slide, you see demand. Um, energy trade balance has gone uh, negative, um, and we can look at that here. So uh, first of all, we'll talk about oil prices in Argentina. They are independent at the time from global oil prices. So you're talking about um, uh, over $70 a barrel uh, for oil in Argentina, and, and um, some uh, 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 seven to ten dollars um, uh, for gas, for natural gas. Um, so there's price incentive at the moment. Um, and you can see uh, that Medanito uh, crude price has increased um, um, reasonably over the years. The government has allowed this increase to offset devaluation. So again, the government recognizes that the value needs to be there to produce. Um, and uh, in, in terms of gas prices, if you take a look at the top right, um, you can see that uh, this uh, uh, light blue sort of line halfway through um, towards the bottom, this is the gas plus price, okay? This is the seven to $10 a barrel that the government is actually providing a, a certain compensation for new gas production. Um, and when you take a look at this, you say that is nothing compared to what the cost is for importing about 30% of your gas um, at anywhere between eight and $17. Um, so there, there's uh, incentive for oil producers. Uh, there's incentive for the government to keep this going. There is some concern that oil prices will fall at some point. Um, but in general, when you take a look at the lower right-hand graph, and you see that uh, uh, Argentina became a net importer of gas in 2008 and a net importer of oil in 2014. Um, there's clearly demand and clearly a reason for the government to have this uh, implemented. Um, I, I, I think that that is uh, all I want to say there. Um, the political and economic environment, um, I, what I'd really like to do is focus on, in commercial, the third bullet, um, 
uh, Argentina bonds are trading at uh, seven point, the 2015 bonds are trading at 7.9% as of February 2015, as compared to 11% as of December 2014. Basically, the market is um, looking favorably upon a transition, a uh, government transition. And I think we're seeing that also in the oil sector. We're seeing tenacity in the oil sector, companies willing to invest, um, maybe not aggressively, but willing to uh, be involved in Argentina at this time, looking towards the next uh, government. Um, you have other issues that are favorable. You have, a, you have a labor, you have unions that actually understand the importance of the oil industry, um, and they tend to be willing to work with the oil companies. And then you've got some macroeconomic issues that, um, uh, that are important. You've got a China currency swap, which has actually uh, helped Argentina to improve its, uh, its, its forex situation. Um, uh, really, uh, the, uh, the, the resolution of uh, the Repsol YPF issues have also helped just create a, a, a more investor-friendly environment. It's not perfect. Um, uh, but uh, uh, things are, I would, I would take a look at Argentina as, as optimistic. And then uh, finally, to kind of give you a sense of what's going on in the country, um, I'm not going to go into these, but I want you to see that there is activity in Argentina in terms of M&A, in terms of uh, new project development. And one of the reasons for that is that Vaca Muerta is proving to be very prolific. Um, uh, you can get with vertical wells a thousand barrels a day uh, out of a, out of a well. Um, uh, this, together with uh, the relatively solid domestic pricing scenario, um, is creating better economics. Also, the new hydrocarbons law allows for a percentage of of your production uh, to be exported. So you're starting to see a little bit more flexibility there, and uh, uh, production costs have come down now to basically you're at a break-even point. And as you can see in the United States, where the learning curve has been very quick, the same kind of thing is happening in Argentina. Obviously not as efficient. Uh, uh, shale is a very difficult sort of factory-oriented play. Um, but uh, you, you are, they are learning very quickly in Argentina how to bring down costs, um, which make all of this uh, viable. Uh, and I will um, actually, what we want to do is, if you have any questions on Venezuela and Argentina, um, I can handle Venezuela really well. I'm not our, Venez our, I'm not our Argentina expert, um, but unfortunately I have to run, so. We can take some questions on Venezuela and Argentina if there are any uh, quickly, or we can kind of proceed through to the rest of the presentation if you'd like. Any burning? Okay. Uh, one out there, yep. Uh, can you just wait for the mic and just state your name and affiliation and your question in the form of a question, please? Uh, for those two countries, what is the prospect for offshore um, activity and, and uh, reservoirs? So um, uh, I'm, I'm not, to be honest, real clear about uh, what the prospect is for Argentina. For Venezuela, there's a good deal of offshore activity happening, um, uh, all at this point natural gas. Um, you've got Plataforma del Tana, uh, which is a project with Chevron uh, south of Trinidad. Um, I think it's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, seven TCF of reserves, uh, I believe. And then you've got um, Cardone 4, which is in the Gulf of Venezuela, uh, about 13 TCF. It's one of the larger uh, natural gas finds in the hemisphere um, over the last couple of years. And that's with uh, Repsol and ENI. and i um, uh, And then you've got a PDVSA-driven project called Mariscal Sucre. Um, uh, you know, all of these projects are going to be looking to bring on well, Marisca Sucre and, and, and uh, Cardone 4 should bring on uh, uh, 450 million cubic feet a day in the next couple years. Uh, most of that will go to the Venezuelan domestic market, um, which is uh, undersupplied at the moment. Uh, some of it will go to Colombia to meet contractual terms with, uh, with Colombia. Hi, Mike Darum, Nova Spontas. Good to see you guys. Dave, wanted you to explore, uh, explore a little more this idea of power by force, what exactly you mean by that, and, and what the kind of the pressure points are that would push that towards uh, an unplanned transition, so to speak. 
Well, uh, by power by force in, a, in, in an on-the-record environment, um, we are basically seeing the, a greater involvement of the military at all levels of government, and more recently, an increased involvement of the military inside PDVSA. Um, uh, we are seeing signs that uh, the Maduro administration is, uh, you know, looking uh, uh, more consistently towards the military to keep order. Uh, let's try to keep it as simple as that. Walter Earl, uh, National Defense University. Um, I, I, I came in late. I apologize. I may have missed something in the beginning, but. Um, I'm wondering if you could comment on uh, management strategies at Peta Vesa. Uh, great question. Um, Peta Vesa has a new board of directors. Um, Elogio Del Pino is, is now the president of the company. Um, the directors that are working with him are all industry people, or for the most part industry people, at least the key directors. Um, uh, uh, we're seeing that Del Pino uh, has an interest in uh, earmarking more of PDVSA's budget towards exploration and production. Um, Del Pino and uh, the Vice President of Exploration and Production at the time, Orlando Chassin, um, are, are two people that have worked consistently and, and effectively with the private sector for years now. Um, they've actually been the two go-to people for resolution of problems uh, that the private sector's had, PDVSA's joint venture partners. Um, so from that perspective, we're looking at it very optimistically. Um, uh, PDVSA and the Venezuelan government are uh, offering options to the private sector to um, gain more managerial control over their projects. Um, basically, this is something called the remediation plan, uh, where the private sector is offering loans uh, to the mixed companies, to those joint venture initiatives. Um, in exchange for some contract adjustments that allow them to move cash flow offshore, um, that allow them greater management of procurement, for example. That's a very big issue. Um, so we're seeing some progress. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's really almost disheartening because we're seeing probably more progress inside PDVSA towards efficiency than we've seen in many years. But this is coming at a time where um, uh, the government is having a hard time uh, keeping up on, on top of things. Um, so PDVSA, even though they're making efforts, they're, they're going to be hard-pressed to have the necessary government support to bring those efforts through to fruition. Hi, Naki Mendoza, Energy Intelligence. Um, questions about production costs. I'm wondering if you have a rough assessment of per barrel production costs for Vaca Muerta Shale and Orinoco heavy oil projects. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd rather get your card and, and send you to my expert, um, my technical expert at the company. In Venezuela, uh, uh, in production costs vary dramatically uh, depending on uh, the type of crude uh, and you know the, the basin. Um, and uh, production costs uh, in Argentina right now for shale, um, last year they were about 80, and now if we take a look at uh, the fact that they're at break even, uh, I guess that's uh, mid 70s. Give me your card later, and I'll, and I'll get my, my, my smart guys in touch with you. Okay, we've got one more question in the back there. Brian Bentrot from Bechtel. Uh, I've read that uh, the um, Venezuelan internal policy for subsidizing oil has led to a big problem with smuggling. What's your view kind of on the, uh, the future of those internal subsidies and how that could uh, impact future oil revenues. We had that question this morning too. Uh, it, it's um, uh, obviously uh, subsidization of uh, domestic gasoline prices is, is a huge issue. Um, uh, you're, you're talking about less than six cents a gallon uh, at the pump in Venezuela. Uh, you're talking about mm, $4 uh, a gallon on the border of Colombia. Um, so the huge disparity creates a perfect opportunity for smuggling. Uh, there's, there's been a couple of high-profile corruption checks, I would guess you could call them in Venezuela, dealing with that particular issue. 
Um, they're not going to resolve it by trying to stop smuggling. The only way to resolve it is by increasing the price of gasoline in Venezuela. And you are never going to increase the price of gasoline to $4 a gallon um, from roughly six cents. Um, so it's going to continue to be a problem. Um, and there are plans. The government is uh, very publicly announcing its interest uh, to um, raise gasoline prices. Uh, it is uh, sensitizing the population to this, the fact that this is going to happen. We don't know where they're going to put the price, um, but it will still be insufficient to um, uh, discourage smuggling, that's for sure. Okay, David, one more, and then, and then uh, I think we can move on. You, you sort of characterize the competition for dollars within Venezuela as being, you know, uh, paying for imports, paying for production, or paying New York. Uh, and you have an optimistic and a pessimistic scenario. In those two scenarios, how does that money get divided? Um, in, the, um, in the optimistic scenario, you've got about an extra $4 billion for oil imports, um, which is the, pretty much the, the diluent that's needed. Um, there are some products involved, too, with gasoline production, um, given the situation of the refineries in Venezuela. Um, so we're, we're throwing we're throwing four billion uh, uh, into into oil imports. Um, you have uh, capex, probably a, a, an additional five billion worth of capex going um, uh, to actual EMP uh, in our optimistic scenario. Um, in both scenarios, you are cutting by sixty percent uh, the budget for social spending. Uh, both scenarios consider inflation at about 120%, and, um, and, and our optimistic scenario uh, also considers cutting um, G to G exports by 50%. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and both scenarios also have some uh, exchange rate uh, modifications, although they're completely counterintuitive uh, um, uh, due to the fact that right now, uh, the G2G exports uh, can be, the, the revenue can be sold at the new uh, rate of 170 bolivars per dollar. Um, and so that actually improves the situation even though it's not a solution. Uh, it improves the investment situation even though it's not a solution to actually getting commercial dollars for those barrels. Okay, so uh, we will uh, switch over to Mexico, which uh, finds itself in an interesting position uh, as it relates to uh, the bid rounds that are that are coming up. But I think what I would say at, at, at the beginning is is that uh, as it relates to the bid rounds, these are long-term investments. So oil prices move up and down, uh, and over a 30-year plus horizon, they're always going to move. So. Slightly inconvenient, yes, but I think it's it's much more important to kind of take a look at the, the macro. And the, and the macro, what you've seen is, is I mean, the, this is the impetus of, of why uh, energy reform finally gelled. Um, we, along with many, many others, uh, have been working and, and, and waiting for energy reform to, to happen uh, over the last 14 years. And you see the, the gray line there of Contrail production, which everybody, I think, is pretty familiar with and the very, very steep uh, production decline that happened uh, w with respect to um, uh, nitrogen injection. Um, so now down at about 400,000 barrels uh, per day. What I really want to kind of take a look at is, is, is that decline rate that you see uh, taking place um, at the bottom. And so between 2010 and 2013, they were able to kind of maintain production, so to speak, uh, or keep it relatively uh, in check, uh, and then this past year, uh, uh, production dropped by by 3.7 percent. Some of that, uh, in large part, is is reform related, uh, and I think that that becomes a big, big question as we kind of go forward. Because one of the one of the big questions and what's different about uh, the the market opening in, in Mexico is that it's really being undertaken in a very, very different kind of way as it relates to its NOC than what you've seen in, in many, many other uh, market openings. So the, uh, um, and, and the government hasn't really defined what it exactly wants Pemex to be uh, on a go forward basis. And I think Pemex in, in many respects is having to kind of pick up that burden 
and define for itself uh, as uh, in the context of the energy reform and what the energy reform allows it to do to define uh, where it's headed um, itself. So what we did is we just, we've taken some moving averages uh, of production and, 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 and then projected that out for, uh, forward. And I think, you know, the important part to take a look at is, is that you see Kumulub Zap, uh, which uh, helped offset some of the production declines of, of Cantarell and now is producing uh, in excess of 800, 850,000 barrels per day. Uh, but that too will now start to decline. It has been, uh, it's also had nitrogen injection um, and uh, those, those declines are, are going to happen. So if you, if, if you go back to the, the previous slide and you say, well, those decline rates then really 2006 through 2008 really started to drop. Clearly, you don't have as much production with Kumulub Zap, but uh, you could have some, you could have some uh, drops that are more significant before they kind of uh, smooth themselves out. Which leads us then to, on a go-forward basis, what, is, what are we looking at? And the top line there is what is included in what's called the Prospectiva. It's, these are the, the official national uh, figures in terms of what production is, is, is going to uh, be. We uh, separated out or, or decided to take out uh, the, the difference between how much is going to come from Pemex uh, production itself uh, plus farm downs, uh, which are allowed under, under the um, energy reform, and then the tenders, the, the bid rounds that, that are going to, to come out, just to really kind of see what we're talking about in terms of context. This is the natural decline rate. Uh, that, that is taking place, so it's a, it's a little bit of a different uh, take than what we saw on the previous slides. Um, but what you have there is, is you have a million barrels per day that you have to fill by 2020, and it goes up to two, uh, two million by 2028. So some of this, you know, this is not all uh, uh, doom and gloom. Uh, some of this will, will happen simply uh, through uh, CapEx investment. But again, I, I, would, I would go back to the, 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 the fact that uh, what exactly is Pemex's role going to be going forward? And I think that really becomes a central theme uh, as we're looking at the kind of macro outlook for, for production uh, out of Mexico. The two takeaways that uh, are glaringly clear to us is that you're going to have to provide a much more flexible regime for uh, farm downs um, at, at Pemex. Right now, the the way that farm downs can take place is that Pemex has to demonstrate to Hacienda or the Secretary of Finance that uh, the money that it will receive uh, through the farm down will be equal or greater than the amount that it is currently receiving. And what you have to understand is, is that once it goes to a farm down, it is going to be subject to a much lower tax regime than it currently is. So the, the, the quick takeaway that you immediately conclude is the only way that you can prove that up, that Pemex can prove that up, is, is that you're going to try to convince Hacienda that you're going to have increased production. Well, how do you do that? That becomes a very, very difficult uh, benchmark uh, to, to, to really achieve. And particularly as, lo as oil prices have gone down, that becomes even much more sensitive within the context of the Secretary of Finance. There's a political element here, and this is where I think we're going to have to, we'll see some type of accord. The, the other uh, side of the coin here is, is that um, the, the bid rounds are going to have to be wildly successful, not mildly successful. Uh, we've gone through the, the multiple service contracts, we've gone through the integrated exploration and production contracts, uh, where you had a handful of, of, of bidders. Um, that's not going to cut it. I mean, if, if we don't see uh, bids uh, that number in, in the range of, of 10 per uh, the, the attractive blocks, that would be a failure in my view. Um, and so that means that you have to have an extremely robust, very uh, market um, uh, normal contract uh, that that is that is going out. We'll we'll talk a little bit about where where we stand with the reform right now. But I think just as a, from a conceptual standpoint, those are the two factors that absolutely have to happen for them to get anywhere near the production levels uh, that they're projecting. If not, the government is going to have to look for alternatives. 
So uh, Mexico, as, as most people are probably aware, uh, entered into a hedge. They've done hedges uh, for a number of years. Uh, just because for a, a trillion dollar market, uh, it is uh, heavily dependent on, on oil revenues. So uh, that has started to decline as there's been fiscal reforms over, over, the, over the years. Um, but they, what they put in place was a hedge for uh, $76.40. And for the budget, they used a, a budgetary price of $79 uh, per barrel. What's interesting is, is that the, the difference is gonna be used through this um, income stabilization fund. What they have allocated to that fund is $530 million. Well, if you do the math very quickly, that takes you out for about a quarter. It doesn't take you out for the entire year. And I think the, the point uh, to be made there is, is that is exactly the reason why, if you take a look down in the lower right-hand corner, uh, the, the government announced uh, budgetary cuts of uh, $8.4 billion. And on top of it, as we'll see on the next slide, uh, they, they did a, uh, a dividend grab of Pem from Pemex of $3.5 billion. So in other words, they're still quite concerned, even though they, they're in much better, uh, much better position than a lot of other Latin American countries, uh, given the fact that they have these hedges, that they're, not that they're not fully covered. And it's also a reflection that the economy continues to be uh, uh, quite stagnant. Um, so it's, it's no surprise that what you've seen is that uh, uh, the, the economic growth, GDP, uh, that was uh, in the budget was estimated at 3.7%, um, has the central bank has come out and now uh, lowered those projections. So, uh, you know, the promises of this administration was is that we're going to get back to the Mexico miracle years, the 1940s to uh, 1980, uh, of 6% kind of uh, average growth. Um, this is still not happening. We have a reform agenda that's, that's on the table. The question is, is now can you really kind of implement that? And energy is absolutely uh, core to that strategy. So making, making this work has to happen. There, there is really no plan B that, uh, that is meaningful enough to, to, to make those kind of changes. So as I mentioned, there was a $3.5 billion kind of uh, a dividend grab at the end of the year that kind of caught everybody by surprise. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to take a look at what that, how, how did the market react? And what's interesting is, is that you saw essentially a doubling of, uh, of spread uh, between the Sovereign and Pemex uh, from last year to uh, the issuances that, that took place uh, this year. If you remember back on those initial slides that, uh, that I said, um, they're still getting very, very attractive money. So even at, 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 on the, I think the 30 year tranche, uh, it's treasuries plus uh, yeah, 330 thereabouts. Um, and so that's still ex extremely attractive money. But what you are seeing is, is that there, is a, there, there has been a widening of, of, of spread that's taken place. Here's part of the crux of, of, of the reform and some of the things that I would, uh, I would point out that certainly are concerning to us. Um, so of the $8.4 billion um, of the budgetary cut, essentially half of that uh, is to be made by Pemex. And uh, then you can see on, on the... Um, on the top of the graph there, the, the different areas of where other bu budgetary cuts uh, were to be made. There's two things that I would point out as it relates to Pemex itself. So Pemex, uh, this, is, this is a problem in terms of the, the $4 billion that its budget is, is being decreased. Um, and that raises questions when you have 155,000 employees of making payroll, uh, of, of doing your, 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 your daily operating type of expenses. Under the reform, Pemex now has uh, discretion over its CapEx. So CapEx and your budget are not necessarily the same. I think it'll be very interesting to see how CapEx will be um, impacted uh, as, we, as we move forward uh, through the year. Um, so the, 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 I think the, uh, the conference call that Pemex will have on Friday will be something that uh, you know, should, should attract some attention uh, specifically on that point. The, um, the other part of energy reform that's very, very critical is the implementation. So you, you need 
institutional framework, you're, you're creating a number of new entities uh, that are going to be um, playing a very significant role, including uh, the ASEA, which is the environmental regulator, um, and then you need a ramping, ramping up of CNH, which is, has already started to, to happen, but as you can see up there, they were looking to, to get to 250 people uh, this year. They're right now at about 120. And then the CRE, which will be actually a very Im, uh, important component, they've been the downstream regulator. They will now be responsible uh, for uh, oil pipelines and all oil uh, infrastructure uh, related um, or infrastructure related uh, oil infrastructure related um, activity um, so they're an established regulator but they don't necessarily have the manpower for all of this there's a hiring freeze uh, across the government so when you take a look at these numbers and the only one that we've not been able to uh, categorize is is, is uh, the Secretary of Energy you're already looking at probably close to 1,000 people that they needed to add for 2015, which have been completely frozen. That doesn't bode well for uh, reform implementation uh, leading up to the bids, nor when you actually have to administer them. So this is a, this is a big problem that hasn't really been, hasn't surfaced and is, is something that is, is, is of, of significant concern to, to us. And then what I would say, just kind of wrapping up on Mexico, is, is putting all of this in context, I mean, the energy reform has, what has been achieved to date has been uh, monumental. And uh, it really should not be uh, understated. Uh, there's been years um, of work that has, that has uh, been put in place to, to get to this point. Uh, but I think the, the spirit of the constitutional energy reform, the secondary laws, was, was fantastic. Um, and that is clearly what motivated uh, tremendous amounts of interest. What we have right now is, is uh, the, um, in December, it was the launching of the, of the uh, 14 exploration shallow water blocks. And so there was a, a, a draft contract that, that has gone out. Um, I think, you know, widely, widely stated uh, industry's reaction has been somewhat lackluster, and for good reason. It's, um, it is, it's, a, it's a first step, but it still needs a lot of work. And what we, what we don't have is we don't have a true uh, production sharing uh, agreement uh, on the table. It really is kind of an amalgamation of, a, of many different parts. Uh, much of its base uh, that, is, that starts with the service contract. So I think the, the good news is, is from where I stand, they have to get there. Uh, the question is, is how quickly can you get there with the manpower shortage that you have? And these people have been working at an exhausting pace. I did 10 years of Wall Street myself, and I can tell you when you're in your 20s, you might be able to do this, but when you're in your 40s, 50s, uh, this gets a lot more complicated. And, these, and, and, and the, the impact is being felt. Uh, you, you have a lot of uh, folks that are, uh, that are absolutely suffering as a result of this, and that's not good uh, for, for what needs to be done. So there's just a tremendous amount of work. The question is, is how is it going to get done, and um, can, you, can you make it happen uh, in an expedited fa fashion? I think you know, the chances that you have uh, further delays uh, are, are real. Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Hope, I think it's actually part of the process that that uh, that needs to take place, um, and um, I think that uh, we'll just have to wait and see what comes out with the the second draft of the contract uh, this next month, and then really how how uh, how the negotiations and the discussions uh, really proceed. Um, so I'll leave it at that in terms of Mexico. So turning to Colombia, Colombia I think is is a country that is um, what I would what I would say is is much more kind of on the cusp. Uh, it, you know they've had a fantastic run uh, over the last decade, um, and production uh, hit a million barrels, and so that was the goal. And uh, I think there was uh, there was a widespread uh, applause for that. Um, and but the question then became, now what? And uh, so oil price uh, declines uh, only are magnifying some of the issues that you, that you really have in, in Colombia today. 
Um, so if you take a look at, uh, we, we just put out uh, three, uh, three of the larger or, or well-known uh, producers uh, in Colombia. And you, you can take a look at the, the CapEx reductions that, uh, that each of them are making. Um, and without ongoing CapEx in Colombia, you probably have a natural decline rate of about 30%. Um, and so I think the, the interesting thing is, is that the ACP had come out, they, they put a letter to the government um, saying what kind of impact, and I'll show you some of the numbers th uh, that, th that we have in terms of uh, production outlooks. Um, but I think one of the things that uh, was said was is that production would actually stay stable in 2015. We don't agree. Um, I think that the chances that uh, production declines occur in Colombia are very, very real. And what you're seeing is, is that people, anybody that has the ability to reduce uh, their capex or delay it, defer it, uh, that's absolutely happening. And in fact, what you're also seeing is you're seeing uh, uh, cancellation of contracts. So contracts are being, uh, th there are operators out there that are, uh, and remember, there's, there, in Colombia you have uh, such a wide array of different operators, so very, very uh, uh, tiny operators to, to larger companies that are, that are operating in the country, which creates a whole different kind of dynamic. Um, but what, what's happening is, is there are operators out there that are absolutely finding it at this stage much more economic to simply pay the penalties and turn that contract back over to the ANH uh, than, than operate. There's, there's very high operating costs in, in a number of these regions, the Llanos uh, in particular, where a, a large uh, uh, percentage of production is, is coming from. Um, you're, you're seeing that uh, production is, is starting to become uh, less economically viable. Um, so, and I think one of the, the bigger areas to kind of focus on is unconventionals. So uh, there had been a big push over the, the last two bid rounds uh, to, to uh, secure activity in unconventionals. Um, the environmental permitting and licensing in, in Colombia is, is really the, the element that has really stifled off uh, a, a tremendous amount of activity. There's been progress that has been made, but it's been very slow. And it's been too slow for the pace of what needs to happen in the context of the global market and where people are going to deploy uh, their, their, their capital. Um, so you know, the question really becomes is what's going to happen with some of those unconventional, that unconventional activity. So there's, there's some drilling that is, um, that is taking place uh, while they're uh, stratigraphic wells, et cetera, that, uh, that people are drilling uh, while they wait for, for permitting, et cetera. If, if that doesn't come back as robust as, uh, as they're hoping, I think we'll probably see some pullout uh, on the unconventional front in Colombia. So what we did here is we took a look at uh, projections and uh, we, we took a look at, so the ACP is, 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 is the association, the Petroleum Association of, of uh, private sector uh, companies um, operating in, in Colombia. Uh, and then the government, you can see what their projections were in uh, uh, last year and then what they've been revised uh, uh, this year. So uh, all across the board, what you're seeing is, is that the, uh, everybody is anticipating that the impact certainly uh, over the next few years will be, will, will be downward. I think the one bright spot is absolutely offshore and we, there's uh, uh, some very significant drilling that's um, uh, coming uh, coming up uh, this year, and that that uh, will certainly help uh, foreign direct investment, but it won't necessarily have an impact on uh, oil production in the short term. Uh, the onshore uh, production is just increasingly complicated because of, as I mentioned, the the permitting and environmental uh, permitting uh, communities, uh, social issues. Um, and then security. Uh, and so what we've seen is, is that I in the month of January, uh, there was in excess of a million barrels uh, produced. Uh, we would uh, say that that's probably gonna be as good as it gets this year. Um, a lot of that, there were, there were no pipeline bombings, um, and we have, uh, we have elections uh, here in the fall, 
uh, so the chances that you, you have pipeline bombings uh, later on in the year are certainly there. Inc uh, uh, kind of uh, incremental uh, um, uh, weather is going to be an issue. It always is in, in, in Colombia. So it's hard to see how, and there's no new production that's, that's coming online of, that's, that of any significance that's going to really kind of change those figures. Uh, so again, what we would say is, is that that's going, it's going to be very, very difficult uh, to, to see that those production figures are, are maintained. And so despite the fact that the, the, the government is saying that they're going to maintain the million barrels, I, I think that uh, you probably have at least uh, 50 to 75,000 barrels today that's kind of in jeopardy for 2015. Um, from, from the uh, government side, uh, unlike Mexico, they had no hedge. And um, uh, over the years, if you, t if you took a look at a chart of the, the, the increased dependence on oil revenues, it's been increasing. So it's now roughly at about 27%. Um, and by the government's own estimates, uh, they're saying that a decrease of $1 has an impact of about $190 million of, of annual revenues. So you can quickly do the math on that, and what that really kind of comes up to is about $9.5 billion of shortfall if you stay at these kind of prices throughout 2015. Um, the, the number of tools that I think the, the, the Colombian government has uh, are somewhat limited, and you could see asset sales. You could, uh, what they will try to, to use is increased taxation, which isn't necessarily going to uh, spur uh, economic activity. Um, and then the other tool that they have in, in, in their war chest is, is devaluation. And so we've already seen devaluation uh, in 2014 of 24%. Uh, and in, in February this year of, of five and a half percent. So could we be moving, you know, much closer to kind of 2,800, 3,000? Uh, yeah, I think that's a, that's a real possibility as we move through the year, it, particularly if oil prices stay at, at these kind of levels. So lastly, I'm going to wrap up just with uh, Brazil. Uh, Brazil is, is certainly a, uh, uh, a massive market, and pre-salt is, is, is the name of the game. Um, I think what's interesting from a macro perspective is, is that uh, Brazil only exports about 20% of its, of its production. And uh, so the impact in, in a certain uh, sense is, is softened on that front. And then, uh, you know, as a, um, as a fuel net importer, uh, those, those uh, prices are subsidized uh, from Petrobras. So as prices are lower, in theory, that should uh, not have as, as big of an impact. Obviously, that's not exactly what's happening uh, in Brazil, and there's other economic kind of fallout that, that's taking place for a whole host of reasons. Um, but, uh, and one of those is, is absolutely the, the, the potential of uh, devaluation kind of offsetting uh, much of, of the, the positives uh, from, from that front. Um, and it will certainly have an impact on, on pre-salt investment. Uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure on, on Petrobras to continue that investment. Uh, the question is, is with some of its partners, et cetera, uh, you know, how that, how that really kind of plays out. So, you know, the goal continues to be the four million. We have beat, uh, uh, that's uh, oil, but it really should be BOE. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, they want to be a top five global oil producer by the end of the decade. I think, you know, the, the, the Cliff Notes version of this is, is that the, the chances that a lot of this gets delayed are, you know, are increasingly quite high. Um, in the case of Petrobras, uh, you, you have $170 billion in debt. So um, in Mexico, we, we thought things were, were quite grim with $80 billion of, of debt. Uh, they've got the pension liabilities, which is, a, which is a, a, another big uh, animal. But $170 billion of debt, I mean, that's exactly why uh, its stock price has, has, has taken the kind of hit. Uh, its leverage is, is increased quite significantly. And the thing that is, that is um, uh, the focal point uh, to kind of be on the watch out of is uh, their ratings. And so the, the, the potential of losing investment grade rating would have just a dramatic impact um, on their needs in terms of, of funding. And that will be something that uh, you'll, we'll need to kind of take a, keep a very close eye on. 
So everybody's quite aware of the corruption scandal, uh, and I think that um, you, you have a new CEO, clearly uh, politically driven. Um, you know, markets have not uh, necessarily reacted very well, uh, which is a takeaway, I think, also for for Colombia for different reasons. Um, as uh, Javier Guterres is 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 on his way out um, as well, and. Uh, how this all kind of plays out, I think, is, is, is still very much in the mix. Um, from, from a macro perspective, um, the, 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 the uh, economy has, has completely stagnated, and so the projections for, for 2015 are uh, essentially anywhere between uh, negative 0.5 uh, to 0.5% uh, on the positive. Um, and uh, much of this is just a, a, a lack of credibility that is being lost by, by the administration and an increased amount of uh, opposition power that is, that is coming uh, into play. And so the, the question is, is how is that all going to kind of impact uh, the economy and impact uh, Petrobras very directly? And I think, um, Again, what we really kind of see is is that uh, the potential for not hitting those targets becomes increasingly uh, clear as we move forward. And just to kind of put in context, I mean, you have about 15% of total production today uh, of the 2.35 uh, million thereabouts of, of production uh, coming from pre-salt, and the expectation is is that 50% of uh, total production will be coming from pre-salt. Um, uh, when they when they look to hit their their goal by 2020, so these are massively ambitious uh, goals, and uh, clearly the low oil price environment will will impact uh, uh, Brazil quite significantly. And with that, I'll conclude my remarks. Thank you very much, John. There's a lot a lot there. Um, maybe what I'll do is ask Carl uh, to maybe think about um, some of the ways from your political analysis or your look at the region, how some of these oil and gas uh, uh, issues in particular feed into the broader economic issues, but also fit into the political landscape as you see it. Yeah, well, I, I think that David and, and John did a, a really great job of providing a sort of a co comprehensive uh, analysis of, of, of a lot of the economic side and how oil touches on that. Um, I, I don't want to get too stuck because I think that the Q&A probably is a good place to tease some of these things out as well. But I would just say, you know, persistently high prices created a set of convoluted incentives. And what we're seeing now is that, uh, you know, the region is sort of the, the countries that were better insulated and better prepared to deal with some of those things are faring better than others. Uh, the political issues and the economic issues are going to sort of complicate the outcome. I mean, particularly in places like Venezuela. Uh, with really high inflation rates, with scarcity, with a lot of political upheaval. Um, you know, if you just look at it through the eyes of, of uh, I think, uh, oil analysis, I think uh, it's, um, it's one side of the discussion, and I think it needs to be sort of complemented. So that's one thing, and I would draw your attention to things like uh, Venezuela's, not, not just its ability to maintain its commitments, because they've been able to do that, but countries themselves uh, and their ability to pay and how much Venezuela needs that money and where it's getting money in order to make up for that. That's one sort of big issue. Um, you you touched on the Brazil issue. Um, that's a, a big deal because a lot of the sort of uh, reforms that they were pushing forth had to do with, you know, all the money that was coming in and the scandals that you're seeing now with regards to corruption I think uh, would be less if you had oil prices at, the pri at where they were before. And they're definitely going to have an effect and an impact uh, on the political environment with the president having been the head of uh, Petrobras and of being uh, the Minister of Energy. So, you know, you definitely have a, a development there. And so far as Colombia and Argentina, you know, um, on the Colombia side, um, the implications to this is, is fairly limited, even though I think oil revenues uh, are an important part of government spending, in particular in the places where uh, the oil rich areas in particular, that they've, they're going to take a pretty big hit. Uh, and if you look at that with regards to, you know, how Colombia is sort of making itself out of this very challenging period 
um, with narco-terrorism, uh, with the guerrillas, um, I think it could influence some of these things. Hopefully it doesn't because, you know, issues like the peace process and where that goes might give it a boost, uh, improve things. Uh, with regards to Argentina, um, that's complicated. <laughs> Big sigh. Um, uh, that, that's a complicated situation. Um, the only area I, I, I'd say uh, in Argentina where you had a sort of clear regulatory framework where people were interested was in energy. And the issues that you have now with Nisman, with a, a lot of the outstanding political issues are really going to take away from the discussions uh, and from the orientation of the government. Um, and I don't know about investors, but I think it's a, a significant uh, distraction away from a lot of the things that could have happened there. Um, regarding Mexico, um, the, um, the benefits that they uh, were hoping to get out of oil and the way that the uh, reforms were sold to the Mexican public were that they would be able to attract a lot of money to do social reform. That's not going to happen. Uh, I, and I would even dare to say, and I think you touched on it a little bit, that um, it's basically a, um, it's a, it's a buyer's market now. I mean, as far as these contracts are concerned, the sellers aren't determining the, the criteria of these contracts. And I think that's going to be a tough one for, for, um, for, for Mexicans to, to, to deal with. Um, uh, again, the Venezuela issue, um, I think we're going to see how that develops. Uh, again, uh, you know, we try to predict Venezuela. I don't know what Venezuela is going to look like, to tell you the truth. I think it's a very, a good friend of mine makes sort of this description that it's, you know, a bus without, without brakes going down a hill and all the Venezuelans are in it and nobody really wants to grab hold of the steering wheel. I don't think that, you know, people make, uh, um, they, they allude to or they try to say that, oh, we're going to have a transition of this or that. I really don't think that we have clarity with regards to how things are going. It's, it, it's a country that's facing a lot of challenges and has the potential to drag other countries with it because of the uh, issues with Petro Caribe, the commitments uh, in Central America and in the Caribbean. So those are things that I would note that sort of have that interface of political and, and, and oil. Um, I think that you guys have done a great job of explaining a lot of the oil um, side of it, uh, and I hope that you know, the side that I explained contributes to that, and I think in the Q&A we can delve even further into it. Sure. So um, we can open up for questions and answers. Uh, same, uh, in a bit of a discussion, same sort of ground rules as before. Please identify yourself and uh, uh, wait for the mic, and please put your question in the form of a question if you can. We'll start for Fernando and then go to the second one. I'm Fernando Freire with Rapid Group. Great presentation. I had two questions with regards to Brazil. First, with the, uh, the crisis going on, do you see any possibility of uh, pre-salt legislation reform going on this year? I know that they're, uh, 2016 is the year they're expecting to do more bid rounds in there. And the second question is, uh, Moody's actually revised the rating for Petrobras yesterday, so they lost the investment grade. Uh, Fitch and the other, not yet. But what are the consequences if they lose that investment grade with all three rating agencies in terms of bondholders and uh, stock prices? Can you give some color on that, please? Thank you. I think I'll, I'll touch on the, the second item uh, first because I think that uh, the, the impact in terms of uh, the cost of, of raising funds becomes a very, very significant issue. And so I think that, uh, you, you know, the chances that you, uh, much is going to, going to be a issue of confidence, I think, to, to a large extent in how the markets perceive uh, the, the, the new Petrobras administration and uh, what exactly is the government doing with respect to the corruption scandal. And I think as Carl uh, pointed out, it probably would have been a lot less of an issue uh, under a higher oil price environment than it is today. Um, so all of these things are much more magnified, and that's that's going to have uh, a much bigger um, kind of impact. Um, given the fact that it's just such a large investment program, I mean, you you have to you have to kind of uh, uh, appreciate the fact that this will have uh, wide uh, spread uh, implications. And so, I think that uh, you know this is a, this is very much a moving target. 
Um, you know, in terms of pre-salt legislation, I think that, um, you know, that, that would be a question that I, you know, we would, uh, I would defer to uh, some of my other colleagues. But I think that, uh, you know, in general terms, the government is going to have to be extremely uh, focused and focused and sensitive to what's what's happening in terms of oil prices and the impact that it's having uh, on on the country. So uh, I think that the, the challenge is, is just that the political situation right now is in such kind of disarray that uh, finding consensus is going to be the challenging uh, piece. Dave Halliday from the Speckman Group. I'm, I'm tracking the oil and the gas issue. Um, I understand that, and thank you so much for the information. Um, what I'm wondering about is we, we keep reading about uh, exploding energy demands in Latin America. And how is that going to be met? Uh, I lived in Chile for three years, and I can hardly recognize the country when I go back and visit it now. Um, we were getting our natural gas from my home from, from Argentina, and that was very, very irregular even then. And with this explosion, are we going to be seeing brownouts, blackouts, like we see in Africa and parts of Europe in Latin America? Yeah, very interesting question. I, I think actually that um, from a macro perspective, you've had massive gas fines uh, around the world. And our view is, is that you're going to start seeing stranded gas. Um, in, in, in different parts um, uh, of the globe. And what it really means to Latin America specifically is, is that they need to uh, develop uh, local markets. Um, and many of these countries, you just, you don't have it. Um, so everybody has uh, had a philosophy of, of exporting to the extent that you can. Um, I made a presentation in Rio de Janeiro back in September, and my opening comment was, for all of you out there that are looking to export your gas, think again. Um, and I think that size and scale is absolutely going to matter. And so uh, to the extent that you don't have size and scale, you better start looking at domestic markets. Um, and so Colombia, where, where I'm based, I think is a perfect example of that where it has uh, you know, signed free trade agreements with the US, et cetera, and it's, it was touted as kind of the gateway to the Pacific. Fantastic, very good, but have you seen tremendous amounts of manufacturing activity uh, you know, move in? Not, not yet, and uh, I think in Colombia specifically, uh, you have a situation now with lower oil prices where Cusiana production has been continuing to, to go down, and uh, the reinjection of gas is, not, is now not going to be viable. What are you going to do with that gas? Uh, exporting that gas is, 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 is not uh, a viable uh, option in and of itself. And um, you're, going to start, you're going to need to start looking for domestic markets. All the offshore uh, exploration activity in, uh, in Colombia, you know, the, the hope is that uh, you're going to find significant volumes of oil, but the reality is, is that you're probably also going to find, at a minimum, significant volumes of gas. So what are you going to do with that gas? Well, if it's on the scale of Mozambique, okay, fantastic, now you can ex export. But if it's not, you better start figuring out what it is. You need domestic policy. And domestic policy, I think, across the region is something that has been lacking and something that um, economics are going to force the reality of some of those things to, to kind of occur. So one of the questions um, uh, that I had sort of grouping all of this together is, you know, we, if you think back, you know, to a whole different era uh, about nine months ago, uh, before we were thinking about low oil prices, we were thinking about sort of the geostrategic implications of the tide oil revolution and the shale gas revolution in the United States. And a lot of people were asking us, so what does this mean for other countries and, and, and other producing countries in particular? And we had sort of basketed them into a, a few key categories. One was sort of the big producers of the world. And then 
uh, another couple of categories were the reentrants, those who were hoping to get back into the market in a big way, right? And we sort of put Mexico uh, and, uh, and to an extent, uh, Brazil and Colombia in that basket, uh, folks that were focusing on reform and focusing on be getting back into the market. And then the other category was sort of the revenue dependents, right? And the revenue dependents were the ones that were sort of, you know, already not willing, living within their means based on sort of their fiscal ra rate of return on uh, uh, their break-even price. And, and so what's been interesting for us is that you've seen sort of an oil price decline, and you know that it won't stay like this forever, but you, you find that countries were at various inflection points in terms of their own concept of the reform, both in terms of domestic political economy, but, uh, but in terms of how they're managing their oil and gas sector. Uh, you've been doing this for a long period of time. Uh, these periods of, uh, of, uh, of shock, of low oil price shock in some of these places, have their ability to, to sort of bring about their own reforms and adjustments. Some of them are to near term weather through a situation and just kind of make it through. And some of them bring about sort of longer term uh, approaches to these issues. If you were to think about it from that context, um, of the countries we've sort of talked about today, would you, do you have anything definitive you would say about any of them? Um, uh, you, you had mentioned sort of on the Mexico perspective, it's not the first time I've heard it, is uh, a delay is not a bad thing. Uh, a delay is not the worst thing ever. It, it's difficult for the domestic political situation, but in terms of the energy reform agenda overall, maybe it's not so terrible. David had sort of mentioned in a Venezuelan context, you know, for the first time in a long time, you've got agreement between sort of, you know, uh, the government and the opposition that more production is needed, right? So do, do you see sort of these coalescing points in some of these, these countries that sort of um, at least give you a direction to look at in terms of longer term uh, impacts and, and, uh, and things to look for. I could probably spend uh, the afternoon talking about some of these things. Um, I, you know, I think that uh, Latin America, it's, it's an interesting flexion point because um, there's been significant growth in many of these countries most of which has been driven by uh, commodities. And so that has created a kind of new level of, of wealth, attention, et cetera. So oil prices once again drop. And the question is, is what are they gonna do this time, right? And I think that uh, the, the, the question is, is are you going to look to diversify your markets uh, this time around, or are you going to continue to be dependent? I mean, I think that gets into a whole geopolitical, uh, you know, type of type of question. The the dynamics that each of the countries are facing, um, some can be lumped together, some are are, are quite different. Um, the you know, I think the the pressure points um, uh, that you have in Venezuela and Argentina, for instance, are, are quite, quite, uh, those are likely to put a lot of pressure to, for production to attempt to be sustained, whereas uh, you'll have different kind of pressure points in, in many of the other countries. Um, so it, I think that does it, you know, does it have an impact on, on, on the political environment? Absolutely. So, I mean, each, each of those countries, for different reasons, people are, uh, as you have oil price drops, uh, it, it uh, fans the fire for opposition to, to say, well, look, they're not achieving these objectives and the economy, you know, my day-to-day my -day life is, is not necessarily improving. Um, and I think that uh, the longer that we go through a low oil price environment, that only becomes more magnified. So uh, you can take a look at this and everybody, most, most stable companies can all kind of weather through three months uh, with, without uh, much issue. But as we move towards six months, nine months, that's when we're gonna start seeing real, real um, kind of pain being felt and uh, the, the implications of that pain uh, kind of manifesting themselves out. And I think um, we'll, we'll have to wait, right? I mean, we're, we, uh, you know, we don't project uh, oil prices, and I think anybody that you know, tries, well, if you're making money at it, I think it's fantastic. But uh, other than that, uh, then uh, you know, it, it, we're, we're all at the, at the mercy of, of markets and how they, how they fluctuate. I mean, if we have some other kind of geopolitical uh, crisis, uh, you know, that can change overnight very, very quickly as well. So 
I think that um, you know the jury is still out. Uh, I think that uh, as as we move towards kind of the middle of the year, that's when I would start you know really looking to see what kind of pain is being felt, and then how governments are really reacting, and are they looking to proactively do things differently, um, uh, or is it kind of at the end of the day more of the same status quo? Thank you. It's, uh, I'll try to make it a short question in three quick parts. <laughs> um, love to get your Bill Berlew with the U.S. Columbia Business Partnership. Um, quick sense of since you're based in Bogota, and uh, since I work on Columbia issues, uh, sense of the fracking debate in Colombia, where it stands, where it's going. Uh, two, um, the government, at least previously, had announced or anticipated spending a lot um, after peace talks were concluded. Um, what Have they scaled that back in your sense now, given what we have just heard about and where prices are? Uh, what's your sense about that going forward? And uh, that's probably also a question for Carl, too. Um, what about um, uh, export of uh, compressed natural gas from Colombia, kind of in line with U.S. policy and we just had the Vice Presidential Western Hemisphere Energy Security export of compressed natural gas into the Caribbean from Colombia. Do you see that as a viable option into you know, Jamaica, Dominican Republic, uh, Haiti, other areas? Thank you. Sorry for the, well, the three parts. Okay. When you when you talk about fracking in uh, Colombia, I think the first thing that you have to look at is is the the legislation that was passed never even mentioned the word fracking. That's a problem. <laughs> um, and the the political dynamics in Colombia um, are are such that the local governments have much more pressure on, I think, on the central government than vice versa. And that has played itself out uh, with oil and gas uh, activities across the board as well as mining uh, sector activities. So fracking has only taken that to another level. Uh, because one of the issues that you've had, historic issues in Colombia, uh, is with respect to water. And um, as an American, being down there, you go, what are you, what are you talking about? There's ridiculous amounts of water in this country. I mean, it's, I think, top five uh, worldwide. But because there's been um, a bad history of uh, good corporate governance that, that's taken place, and there's a lot of illegal mining that takes place in, in Colombia, uh, it's an issue that you talk to anybody on the street and everybody says, oh God, you know, that's horrible. Um, and so then you start uh, talking about fracking and it's, it's another four letter word. So I think that um, they've made progress. Uh, I don't wanna be completely negative on, on this point because I think from a macro perspective, the, there's essentially three areas where Colombia is, is trying to uh, gain ground. Um, so offshore is, is one of them, second one is, is absolutely unconventionals, and three is heavy oil, but heavy oil is now not proving up so well, so it'll probably be EOR-related uh, activity. Um, I don't see under this administration uh, that you're going to see much progress. Uh, the, the, the central government has been extremely hands-off as it relates uh, to, to local related issues, and this is just going to kind of fall into the heap of all of that. Um, uh, I think that, uh, you know, the peace process, as you point out, is going to be extremely expensive. So um, there, there are benefits. The question is, is how fast do those benefits um, uh, take hold? And I think that it, it's truly hard to appreciate and understand the cost 
of, of integration. Uh, so everything from integrating uh, 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 former FARC members, et cetera, back into the community, creating employment, creating, um, I mean, Columbia ter terrain, uh, t you know, for those people that have not been there is just incredibly, incredibly complex. And so the infrastructure as a result is marginal. Um, where are you going to get that kind of investment? Well, hopefully, you know, uh, some folks uh, here in Washington, D.C. are going to help out on, on that front. Um, but I think that it's, it's, um, it, it's a big, big question, and I, I think it's, it's hard to truly estimate just what that cost is going to be. And it, when you have a oil price reduction and you have 30 percent of your budget, that is uh, being directly impacted by this. I think the the simple answer is is that it's going to be impacted, and it's you're just not going to have the money to to spend on on those areas. Um, and you know, in terms of uh, the export of uh, compressed natural gas to, to to Central America, I think you know Central America always uh, you know is is there's a lure because there's such a need for uh, uh, for hydrocarbons. Uh, the issue consistently is are they going to pay or can you get them to pay uh, you know market prices and so they've had a history of essentially subsidized uh, production some of which we we talked about uh, this afternoon um, as there's new realities geopolitical realities in, in the market maybe that changes um, and so I think it for different reasons, I think it becomes an interesting thing to kind of take a look at. Uh, today, I'm not extremely optimistic. Certainly, there are people that are out there, uh, you know, trying to do some of those projects. But I think that um, on the gas side, you're likely to, there's been a lot of talk over the years of will we have a uh, global natural gas price? And I think that. Um, what we're actually seeing is we're, we'll probably see more convergence between the, uh, the, Japan, the Japan market and the NBP. Um, and so, in other words, countries that are uh, importers of gas and then those that are actually uh, self-sustained markets. So for the Americas, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of gas in the Americas. I mean, uh, from, from the U.S., Canada, uh, uh, and, um, you know, Venezuela still doesn't export. Peru is sitting on tremendous amounts of reserves that once it gets uh, some of it, the political uh, will to, to do some of those projects will absolutely move forward. Um, and if you get an opening, a very successful opening in, in Mexico, I mean, the chances that you're going to see increased amounts of, of production there are, are very, very high. So I think, again, it's uh, will you have stranded gas? I absolutely believe that you will. And so then you better be sure that you are competitive in the projects that you're, that you're undertaking and or that you've got just some uh, lock solid uh, uh, contracts in place. And you know what I would say, uh, I, I started out my career doing workouts, and the one thing that you learned very, very quickly was it didn't matter what was on paper. If somebody wants to get out of a contract, they're going to. <laughs> Uh, we've reached sort of the, the, the end of the session for today. John, I just want to thank you. There's not very many people who cover that much ground in a short period of time and as well as you did. So thank you very much, and thanks to Carl. Uh, if you could please join me in thanking uh, John Padilla and his colleagues. Thank you.